Hi, I'm Sylvia of IFRSbox.com and I help people understand IFRS. I have created two courses, IFRS in one day, which helps people grasp the basics of IFRS. And the other product is called IFRS Kit, which goes much deeper into the concept of IFRS. And you'll see how to apply IFRS on more than 100 case studies sold in Excel. So if you're interested, visit IFRSbox.com and see how these valuable courses can make your life easier. Let's go through the standard IS-36 impairment of assets. The objective of IS-36 is to ensure that assets are carried at no more than their recoverable amount and to define how recoverable amount is determined. The rules in IS-36 apply basically to all assets except for inventories that's arranged by IS-2, financial assets that's IFRS 9, deferred tax assets IS-12, Assets arising from employee benefits, that's IS-19. Assets arising from construction contracts, you need to look to IS-11. Investment property carried at fair value, that's IS-40. Agriculture assets carried at fair value, that's IS-41. Insurance contracts, IFRS-4. Non-current assets held for sale, that's IFRS-5. And these are assets that IS-36 does not apply to. And the list is quite extensive. So for what assets do you need to use IS-36? Lands, building, machinery, all in line with IS-16. Also investment property carried at cost. Intangible assets arranged by IS-38, goodwill. Investment in subsidiaries, associate and joint ventures carried at cost. And assets carried at revalued amounts under IS-16 and IS-38. Let's firstly look to what the impairment stands for. An asset is impaired when its carrying amount exceeds its recoverable amount. Well, carrying amount is an amount at which an asset is recognized after deducting any accumulated depreciation or amortization and accumulated impairment loss. And recoverable amount represents a higher of assets fair value, less cost to sell and value in use. So if carrying amount is higher than recoverable amount, a difference between the two is impairment loss. How shall we find out that some of our assets are impaired? Each entity who wants to comply with IFRS has to do some work at the end of each reporting period. It's necessary to assess whether there is an, any indication, external or internal, that an asset might be impaired. You don't need to perform testing each year, just assess indicators. But if there is any indication, then asset must be tested. However, if an entity owns certain intangible assets with indefinite useful lives, such as some trademarks or intangibles not yet available for use, then an entity must perform impairment tests annually, even if there's no indication of impairment. Finally, at the group level, when there is a goodwill recognized on business combination, it must be tested for impairment annually. Now, what shall we consider when assessing indications of impairment? First, we will look to external sources of any potential impairment. If during the financial period, assets market value has declined significantly more than it would be expected as a result of the passage of time or normal use. Significant changes with adverse effect have taken place during the period or will take place in the near future, for example, some technological, market, economic or legal changes that may affect environment where the entity operates. Market interest rates or other market rates of return on investments have increased during the period and such an increase might affect the discount rate used in calculating assets value in use. And next, carrying amount of the net assets of the entity is higher than its market capitalization, while this is applicable to company which shares are publicly traded. There are also certain internal sources of information to look at obsolescence or physical damage of an asset. Some significant changes with an adverse effect on the entity, but this time internally initiated, for example, plans to discontinue or restructure some operations. Evidence is available from internal reporting that indicates that the economic performance of an asset is or will be worse than expected. Now, there are certain indications of impairment in relation to investments in subsidiary, jointly controlled entity or an associate too. If you find that there are some of these indicators of impairment, you need to calculate impairment loss as a difference between carrying amount and recoverable amount. But how do we figure out recoverable amount? It is higher of assets or cash generating units fair value less cost to sell, 
and value in use. It's not always necessary to determine both of them. Just one of them might be sufficient, because if just one of these two is higher than assets book value or carrying amount, then there is no impairment and it's not necessary to estimate the other amount. Also, very often there is a situation when there is no basis for making reliable estimate of fair value, particularly when the asset is not trading in an active market. In such a situation, value in use might be considered as assets recoverable amount. Let's explain how to determine fair value less cost to sell. You need to look to standard IFRS 13 fair value measurement to set the fair value of the non-current asset. I have posted a summary of IFRS 13 on this channel. Cost of disposal include legal costs, stamp duties or similar transaction taxes, cost of removing the asset or bring the asset into conditions suitable for sale. So let's take a look at value in use now. Value in use is the present value of the future cash flows expected to be derived from an asset or cash generating unit. You need to take several aspects into account. An estimation of future cash flows that entity expects to derive from the asset. When estimating cash flows, an entity must include any expectations about possible variations in the amount or timing of these cash flows. Then once cash flows are established, we have to take time value of money into account and therefore it's necessary to discount those future cash flows to present value using appropriate discount rate. When establishing our cash flows, we shall also take the price for bearing uncertainty inherent in the asset into account. Also, other factors such as eventual market illiquidity shall be incorporated in the determination of value in use. When you want to determine assets value in use, you need to estimate the future cash inflows and outflows to be derived from continuing use of the asset and from its ultimate disposal. It's good to do so in a table that lists cash flows separately for each period, mostly a year, but can be shorter if convenient and necessary. Once you have your cash flows in a table, it's necessary to select appropriate discount rate and discount these future cash flows using this rate. Some of present values of cash flows in individual years is value in use. When establishing future cash flows from continuing use of the asset, an entity must have a reasonable and sound basis to build on. First, cash flow projections should be based on reasonable and supportable assumptions that represent management's best estimate of the economic conditions that will exist over the remaining useful life of the asset. Then cash flow projections shall be based on the most recent financial budgets or forecasts approved by the management, but careful, exclude any cash flows related to future restructuring or from improving assets performance. Projections shall cover maximum period of five years unless longer period can be justified. Cash flow projections until the end of remaining use flight of an asset under review should be estimated by extrapolating cash flow projections based on steady or declining growth rate. So what items shall be included in cash flow projections? First, cash inflows from continuing use, for example, revenues generated by the use of asset under review. Then cash outflows that are necessarily incurred to generate cash inflows from the continuing use of the asset and can be directly attributed or allocated on a reasonable and consistent basis to the asset. For example, day-to-day -day servicing, directly attributable overheads, allocated overheads, etc. Then net cash flows, if any, to be received or paid for the disposal of the asset at the end of its useful life. For example, sale proceeds less some expenses necessary to bring the asset to conditions suitable for sale. Let me warn you about inflation. You can project your cash flows in nominal terms, that is including inflation, or in real terms, that is in current prices excluding inflation. Either way you do, it's okay, as soon as you don't forget to be consistent in determining your discount rate. Now, what cannot be included in future cash flows? As they shall reflect only current conditions, any cash flows expected to arise from future restructuring to which an entity is not yet committed should be excluded from projections. Cash flow projections should not include any future cash outflows that will improve or enhance the asset's performance nor the related cash inflows, while these outflows are included only when they are incurred. However, future cash outflows necessary to maintain assets' current conditions are included.
Now, to avoid double counting, estimates of future cash flows should include neither inflows related to financial assets such as receivables, nor outflows related to liabilities such as payables, provisions or pensions. Estimates of future cash flows shall also exclude any cash inflows or outflows from financing activities, because time value of money is already considered by discounting estimated future cash flows. Similarly, income tax receipts or payments are excluded because discount rate is determined on a pre-tax basis. Let's look at selection of appropriate discount rate now. Discount rate shall be pre-tax rate, that is, before any income tax effects. Discount rate should reflect current market assessment of both the time value of money for the periods until the end of asset's useful life and risk specific to the asset. When determining discount rate, we must not forget that any risk or any factor that was considered and included in cash flows shall not be incorporated into discount rate assessment and vice versa. The best method for determining your discount rate is to take current market rate for any other assets with similar risks and timing. However, there could be a situation when there is no market rate available. In such a case, you can estimate discount rate by using surrogates such as weighted average cost of capital determined using techniques such as capital asset pricing model or alternatively, companies or entities incremental borrowing rate or other market borrowing rates. And then you should adjust selected basis to reflect risks specific for assets not included in the surrogate or vice versa. Once you have calculated the amount of your impairment loss as a difference between assets carrying amount and its recoverable amount, you need to recognize this impairment loss in the financial statements based on the model applied. When an entity applies cost model for the asset under review, then the impairment loss is recognized immediately in profit or loss, for example, by debiting impairment loss account and crediting the asset, probably some adjustment account. But when the entity carries its assets under review at revalued amount, for example, in accordance with revaluation model in IS 16, then any impairment loss shall be treated as a revaluation decrease in accordance with that standard. In this case, by direct debit to equity, as in line with IS 16 for revaluation model, and crediting the asset or adjustment account. If there's no revaluation surplus in equity, then the impairment is debited to profit or loss immediately, even if it's revaluation model. After the recognition of an impairment loss, it's also necessary to adjust depreciation for future periods to allocate assets revised carrying amount, less its residual value, on a systematic basis over remaining useful life. Sometimes it's not possible to determine recoverable amount for individual asset. Well, it's in the case when value in use is probably very different from fair value less cost to sell. And at the same time, it's not possible to calculate value in use for individual asset because it does not generate cash inflows largely independent from others. So we here we come to concept of cash generating unit that is the smallest identifiable group of assets that generates cash inflows that are largely independent of the cash inflows from other assets or groups of assets. Analogically, as for individual assets, an impairment loss for cash generating unit arises when its carrying amount exceeds recoverable amount of cash generating unit. As we are dealing with some group of assets, it's very important to stress that carrying amount of cash generating unit shall be determined on the basis consistent with the way the recoverable amount of cash generating unit is determined. So you need to take the same items into account. In the carrying amount of cash generating unit, we shall include carrying amount only of those assets that can be attributed directly or they directly belong to the unit. Then we shall include also assets allocated on a reasonable and consistent basis to the cash generating unit. On the other hand, cash generating unit shall not include any recognized liability unless recoverable amount of cash generating unit cannot be determined without consideration of this liability. Let me also explain impairment in relation to goodwill in business combinations. Where it simply said, when one entity acquires another one, goodwill often arises. And for the purpose of impairment testing, goodwill shall be allocated to each of acquirers, cash generating units or group of them based on benefits expected from the synergies of combinations to the lowest level within the entity at which the goodwill is monitored for internal management purposes, but not larger than operating segment.
IS-36 then prescribes how to perform testing of cash generating unit with some allocated goodwill. We need to test it for impairment annually and whenever there is an indication that the unit might be impaired. In this case, testing means comparing carrying amount of cash generating unit and goodwill allocated with the recoverable amount of that unit as a whole. If a carrying amount is greater than recoverable amount, then there is an impairment loss. In such a case, how do we allocate this impairment loss? First of all, impairment loss shall reduce the carrying amount of any goodwill allocated to cash generating unit or group of them. Then if after reducing goodwill there is still some impairment loss left, allocate the rest to other assets in cash generating unit pro rata on the basis of their carrying amounts. And that means that impairment loss of the whole cash generating unit is in fact a bunch of impairment losses on individual assets and is recognized as such. But again, you should be very careful here because you are allocating impairment loss of the whole thing to single items which probably were not or could not be tested for impairment individually. And therefore, you must watch out not to reduce carrying amount of any individual asset in the group below the highest of its fair value less cost to sell, its value in use, which is recoverable amount together, and zero. When dealing with the impairment loss of cash generating units or business combinations, there might be a complication with so-called corporate assets. Those are assets other than goodwill that contribute to the future cash flows of both cash generating unit under review and other cash generating units. Typical examples of corporate assets are headquarters, administrative building, EDP equipment or a research center. If there are some corporate assets an entity is testing cash generating unit for impairment, it must identify corporate assets that relate to cash generating unit under review. And if a portion of corporate assets carrying amount can be allocated to that unit on some reasonable and consistent basis, then entity compares the recoverable amount of that unit with its carrying amount plus allocated portion of carrying amount of corporate asset. But if allocation of corporate assets is not possible, then we go bottom up direction. If an allocation is not possible at the lowest single units level, we shall try to allocate corporate assets at a higher or group level. Last topic to cover in this video is reversal of impairment loss. When impairment loss was recognized in previous periods, at the end of current period an entity must assess whether there is some indication that this loss no longer exists or is smaller. As a minimum, an entity must assess certain indications from internal and external sources. Both group of indicators are the same as when you identify the impairment loss, just from the opposite direction. If an entity finds such an indication that asset might no longer be impaired in recognized amount, then it must assess the need to reverse impairment loss. Only when there is a change in estimates used to determine assets recoverable amount in previous period, impairment loss already recognized might be reversed. You cannot reverse impairment loss due to changes in assets recoverable amount coming from passage of time. If loss was recognized for individual asset, but except for goodwill, the loss can be reversed, but such reversal cannot result in increased or revised carrying amount higher than would be original carrying amount after regular depreciation charged. Reversal shall be recognized exactly as impairment loss directly to profit or loss or alternatively as revaluation increase if assets are carried at revalued amount according to applicable standard. As there is new carrying amount after reversal, depreciation for future periods shall be adjusted to reflect new estimates, remaining useful life, residual value, etc. Adjustment of depreciation is treated in future periods with no restatement of previous ones in line with IS-8. When we are dealing with a reversal of impairment loss for cash generating unit, the thing is a bit more complicated because its reversal shall be allocated to the assets of the unit except for goodwill, pro rata based on their carrying amounts and it will be treated exactly as for individual assets. Revised carrying amount of any asset cannot exceed lower of its recoverable amount or carrying amount that would have been determined without any impairment loss. If the reversal is even greater then no full reversal is recognized. Finally, as I have already mentioned, an impairment loss recognized for goodwill shall not be reversed in subsequent periods. So that was the short summary of IS-36. I appreciate you watching the video and I trust you learned a lot.
If you want to take your IFRS knowledge a little deeper, check out a sample of IFRS in one day by signing up for email updates at ifrsbox.com. You'll also receive the ebook Top 7 IFRS Mistakes. You'll be joining thousands of other accountants who have benefited from my courses. Thanks again and have a nice day.